Hello and welcome to our honor seminar, What We Leave Behind, A History of Fashion, Architecture, and Decor. I'm Julie levitt Learson. I am an MFA costume designer here at Fairfield University, and I wanted to get us rolling on our topic this semester by defining a few key terms. So this lecture is titled Fashion, Fabrics, and Textiles. So let's start with the basics. What are clothes? So um, dictionaries will define clothes as covering for a person. So that's what we're talking about. If we're talking about dress, which is a synonym for clothes, we're talking about personal attire or adornment, particularly that part which is external and serves as adornment as well as covering. So dress sounds a little bit more specific than clothes. We're talking about the things that we put on the outside of our body to be seen. A garment is an article of dress. So any particular piece of clothing can be referred to as a garment. And an ornament is something that is used to decorate, beautify, or embellish a garment or a person's body. And it sounds a little bit silly to be defining these terms this way, maybe, but I wanted to get us all on the same page to be thinking about clothing as a series of intentional choices. Because to be human is to wear clothes. Animals do not wear clothes. Animals stay in the fur or feathers or skin or fins um, that have been given to them by Mother Nature. Human beings put things on our bodies and change our bodies intentionally. We have been clothing ourselves for tens or perhaps even hundreds of thousands of years. So why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we change our body as nature presented it to us? You might think of the obvious answers as being to protect the body from the weather and the elements or to preserve modesty. But perhaps the biggest reason to wear clothes is because clothes serve the function to tell other people something about the wearer. So what can clothes tell us about the wearer? Lots of things. You can refer to this list, but clothes will tell us about our age, our gender, our social status and wealth, our personality, yada, yada, yada. So let's move on to this term of fashion, because a lot of times what clothing is doing is being fashionable or unfashionable, and this class is called, in part, a history of fashion. So when we're talking about fashion, we're talking about a prevailing custom style or characteristic of dress. So it's a particular way we're putting garments and ornaments together to tell other people about where we are in a particular moment in time and where we are in a particular social strata. So sometimes you might think of something as a costume, um, and costumes are things that appear on the stage in theater, but costume is also a term that's used in fashion. When we're talking about costume, we mean the style of clothing, hairdressing, and personal adornment typical to a particular place, time period, or group, etc. So a costume is kind of the whole outfit put together. And one more term I want to get us familiar with is a textile because most of our clothes are made out of some kind of textile and a textile is a woven knitted or felted cloth used to make clothes and also footwear bags baskets or nets so textiles come together to make garments garments come together to make a costume and fashion comes to costume comes together to make fashion So what might fashion tell us about a culture or a society or a particular moment in time or place on the planet? And here is a list of some of the things that fashion might tell us about a culture, what their, what their religious values are, how they perceive gender roles, how they view class structure. Is it rigid or is it fluid? How wealthy is a society? How... Uh, insular they are keeping to themselves or how open they are to other cultures and societies, how diverse that society is or how homogenous it is, and how secure they feel about themselves. 
Well, my goodness, how can clothes communicate these big and complicated ideas? Let's break it down into four categories. The first one is silhouette. And when we're talking about a silhouette, we mean the outline of a body in a set of garments or a costume. So you can see these are images of two women in two different sets of clothes, and I have blackened the entire space taken up by their bodies and their clothes, so all you see is the outline of their forms. So the silhouette reveals or conceals or distorts the natural human form. As you can see, this lady on the left, who might have been at home in a court in France in 1775, she has these, you know, ridiculously wide hips. We can't see her legs. Her hair and head have gotten very, very tall and exaggerated. Her arm has this sort of extension with this fan that she's holding on one side. So we see very little of her natural form. She's been kind of contorted and expanded in all kinds of different ways. The lady on the right-hand side, who is in a fashionable silhouette from the late 1920s, you can see a lot more of her. You can see her legs, you can see her arms, you can see her neck and the shape of her skull because her hair has been cut very short and molded to her skull. But you'll notice um, you can't really tell her feminine figure, the ratio between her chest, her waist, and her hips. Lady on the left, you can kind of see that she's got a bit of an hourglass going on that has a very wide bottom on that hourglass. Um, lady on the left is more, lady on the right is more of a column. So the fashionable silhouette changes throughout history. Obviously, quite a bit of time has gone by between 1775 and 1928 in Europe or America, but the fashion looks quite different. And we have changing silhouettes all the time. Think of mom jeans from the 1990s versus the kind of low riding skinny jeans that were popular until about a minute ago. And now I hear mom jeans are making a comeback. So silhouette is this outline of the body in clothes and it's a distortion of the human form and it changes with taste and fashion. So silhouette is one way a society can communicate some ideas through fashion. Another tool that they can use is texture. And when we're talking about texture in fashion, we are typically talking about the fabrics that are being used, the textiles, uh, to create the garments, right? So texture is all about how the fabric of a garment feels, how it looks, and how it behaves. Textures can be rough or smooth, they can be heavy or light, they can be stiff or soft, they can communicate a sense of luxury or of poverty. And the texture of a garment may kind of allow the fluid movement when the body is in motion, or it may resist movement if there is a stiff understructure that's kind of holding things rigid. The body moves, but the structure stays the same whereas other textures kind of float and flow with the body as they move. And you can see in this slide, I have two women wearing reproduction 16th century English gowns. The lady on the left is from the upper echelons of society. The lady on the right is from the lower echelons of society. You can see the silhouette is nearly identical, but the textures of the fabrics used to make that silhouette are different. And those differences in texture are communicating ideas to us about these women and where they stand in the society. Next tool we have is color. So again, color is largely gonna be a function of the textile and accents like jewelry and things like that that go with it, right? But color has emotional and symbolic importance. We attach a meaning to certain colors as kind of a code um, given to us. And that code, the meaning of those colors varies from culture to culture and time period to time period. So here I have three bridal couples from now. Um, couple on the left is wearing traditional wedding colors of England. Couple in the middle is wearing traditional wedding colors to Ghana. 
a couple on the right, traditional wedding colors for India. So you can see a bride looks very different to these three cultures, and so does a groom. The fourth tool I wanted to discuss with you is accent. And so accents are little tiny details on a set of clothes, on costumes, or on a body that help the viewer of that clothed body focus our attention on a specific part of the costume or figure. So these things could include jewelry, trims, um, buttons. They could include things like hats or headwear, um, accessories like watches or pocket squares. They also could include hairdos. It's important to remember that accents aren't necessarily just going to be about the clothes, right? I've already mentioned hairdos, but um, they could also be the makeup on the face or body modifications like piercings or tattoos or other things like that. Um, accents can also be decorations or ornaments on the garments or even just changes in the color or texture, contra moments of contrast. Um, like we see this man in the blue suit and he has that red bow tie. So there's an accent right there because there's a color change. It draws our eye right towards it. Uh, and accents can also include footwear like those uh, kind of sky high heels on the bottom left corner. Jewelry is perhaps one of the um, most popular forms of accents. And so just to remind us, um, jewelry can be made from a variety of different materials uh, and I have them listed all here. So as I said, right, to be human is to be clothed. We have been working these four tools for many, 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 many thousands of years. So let's kind of work our way back to the beginning. And, and when we started making clothes, what did we start making them out of? Natural textiles, things that were around us, things that were found in nature that we could manipulate um, to create clothes. And so the first clothes were probably animal skins and hides from animals that we had hunted for food. Uh, and then um, kind of vegetable matter that was around like grasses and leaves and barks from trees. With textiles, right, this is the art of manufacturing cloth, turning something into cloth. And that's we think is at least 30,000 years old. When we started making textiles, turning something into cloth, we came up with four basic ones. Linen, which is um, made from thread spun from stems of the hemp plant. Cotton, made from thread spun from the seed pods of the cotton plant. Wool, which is hair from sheep, goats, camels, or other animals. And silk, which is a fiber that is the winding of the cocoons for moths that have been fed on mulberry leaves. So from our four textiles, two were vegetable from plants and two are protein based from animals. And I'm going to go into a little bit deeper explanation of each of those on the following slides. So here are some examples of linen textiles. You can see um, they all have a similar quality to them. There is a softness to linen fabric. There tends to be a little bit of a luster kind of shine to it. They can be very finely woven or they can have a sturdier texture. Um, and you can dye them different colors and um, make different weaves with them that we'll get into later. Linen, uh, because it comes from a plant that um, is a reed-like plant, Linen tends to absorb and then wick away moisture very quickly and easily. So it's a great fabric to keep you cool. Um, and it's easy to wash. It does tend to wrinkle very easily. So people who don't like to iron tend to not like linen. Um, and it's a fabric that doesn't like to dye very well. It's, it's hard for dye to stay in the fabric. So lots of times you'll see linen in light colors or white or off-white colors. But it's kind of a trick to turn um, 
flax plants into linen textiles. And I'm just in awe of our ancestors who figured this out because it's quite a process. You can see here, I'm showing you pictures of the linen plant. It's a really pretty flower um, with the nice tall stem. But if you see the stem's interior, you kind of crack it open. It's got all of these little kind of thready fibers in it. And that's what we want. So to make linen fiber, we have to kind of crack that tough exterior stem of the plant and get to the, the skinny little fibers that are inside. And so we do that by um, the process I'll get into on the next slide. So these plants tend to grow along rivers. They like water and dampness. And so first we have to cut the plants down and then we need to lay them down in some water and let the plant rot for a while so that that outer um, tough exterior of the plant gets softened um, and that process is called redding. Once the outer edge of the stem has rotted down and gotten soft we peel that away so that the softer inner stems um, are available to us then we have to clean them then we have to dry them and then you can see we're left with that kind of hairy um, fiber that you can see on this um, picture on the bottom. Then once we have those fibers, we need to spin them into threads because otherwise we'll just have a bunch of like sticky hairs all over the place. So we need to spin them into one long thread. And then once we have all that thread, we take those threads and we weave them together on a loom to make the cloth. So this takes forever. And I don't know how we figured it out the first time, but I'm so grateful that we did. And here you can see some examples of textiles made out of linen. Linen is perhaps the oldest textile that we have um, worked with, right? Because uh, hides from animals technically aren't a textile, they're hides. So you can see here in the center, this is what remains of what we think was a dress um, made of linen found in Egypt, and it's about 5,000 years old. And we can tell that the, this had been worn by a person because when it was discovered in a tomb, it was discovered inside out, and the elbows showed signs of wear. So that means someone had worn it and worn it often enough to kind of wear a soft spot in the elbows, and then for some reason in this tomb in Egypt, took it off and then, you know, like a teenager, <laughs> threw it in a ball in a corner inside out. On the left hand side, you'll see some linen smocks. One is for a man and one is for a woman. These were made in England in the 1500s and they have been embroidered, embellished with black thread. So a contrast, that accent that we're talking about um, to make um, some floral designs and patterns. Um, you can see that the bottom half of those smocks um, are plain. That's because those would have been tucked into bri britches if you were a guy or hidden under a skirt if you were a girl. And so no one else would see them. So they get to be kept plain. But people might see your sleeves or your collar or your shirt front. And so they are embellished. On the right hand side, we see a linen suit from about um, 1900. This is a woman's walking suit. You can see it has been embellished with um, some applique lace attached to it. And we have some decorative buttons and there's a little belt in the back. Um, this is a two piece garment that has been tailored to fit the body. So long, long history of using linen um, remains a popular textile even today. On to our next te textile, we have wool. Again, this is a sample of different kinds of wools that are thicker, thinner, woven in different ways. Um, they have um, different qualities to them depending on how you handle them. The earliest way we probably handled wool was we probably um, stuck it all into a pot of hot water and spun it around with a spoon or a stick until it all kind of smooshed together and made a, a, a solid mat of fibers stuck together every which way, and that was called felt. But eventually we figured out how to spin the fibers into threads and then weave or knit those fibers. When we're talking about wool, it is a textile that comes from any number of different animals. Obviously we most commonly think of sheep, but you can also get wool from goats, from alpacas, from vicuñas, 
which is a cousin to an alpaca. They're another South American animal. Camels, um, particularly the Asian camel, and rabbits, angora rabbits. Again, getting wool from the animal to the garment is a bit of a process. Um, it takes quite a bit of, of manipulating and handling. With wool, we, we give the animal in question a haircut and the animal remains unharmed. And then we need to kind of um, get any debris out of the wool and we need to then comb it so that all of the fibers are going in the same direction because as you can see, it's kind of you know, fleecy and all over the place. And then once we have all the fibers lying in the right direction, we need to twist them together into yarns. And here are some different things that you can make with wool. You can see um, those orange slippers are kind of an example of felted wool. Um, you can see on the bottom right hand corner, that's an uh, Egyptian sock that was knitted. So we've been knitting for a long time too top left hand corner this is a, a woman and child from Peru and she's wearing several different kinds of woolen textiles on her and her child um, her sweater looks like it might have been knit then she has a wool woven shawl and then her hat is of wool and it's felted and then her her kiddo has a knit cap as well that's also wool Wool can be tailored very well. It tends to react very well to steam and water. Um, so you can shape it in lots of ways and it won't wrinkle the way linen will. So it's really good for military uniforms. So this is, um, I believe this is Alexander II of Russia's military uniform on the bottom left-hand corner. Um, it also can take dye quite well, as you can see from these bright colors. So we have um, a cashmere shawl that was quite a luxury item about 200 years ago. The lady in the brown dress, that's a printed wool fabric. And then the top right hand corner is a bathing costume from about 100 years ago. So yes, people would wear wool bathing suits. Like linen, wool has a good um, property of keeping you cool or warm um, because think of what its job is to protect the sheep in all kinds of weather. So it's going to protect us in a similar way. And wool tends to be a bit water repellent or resistant. On to our next textile, which is silk. Silk um, was developed in China several thousand years ago. Um, China kept it a, a very closely kept secret on how they obtained this textile, um, but eventually the secret got out and um, it has fed global trade for centuries. So you can see a variety of textiles here, but you can see that silk tends to be very shiny and that shine is what gives it this sense of luxuriousness. Um, we've got several different kinds there. We've got some satin, we have some chiffon, which is very light and flowy. We have um, some velvet, which is which is um, you know really kind of squishy to hold on to, uh, and we have some printed um, satins as well. Again, all praise to the person who figured this out many many years ago. You can see in the top left hand corner, that is the moth from a silkworm, and so when a silkworm is ready to become a moth, they build themselves a cocoon, and we to get this textile. Um, kill the moth or the caterpillar or whatever stage it's in there and then gently unwind the cocoons you can see those very thin filaments coming off those cocoons on the bottom left hand side and as you can see the bottom right hand picture going from the cocoon to the fiber takes a bit of doing um, you, you soak these cocoons in water to loosen the the kind of glue that's holding the cocoon together you wind them on this um, kind of windless machine over here to, to straighten the fibers out, and then you twist them and spin them into thread. So here are some garments made of silk of different types. And you can see, even though China um, had the silkworms and kept that tech very close to home, um, it quickly became a global textile. So you can see there's a silk garment from China at the top of the page, but then we have um, a garment from, uh, I believe that's Morocco, that kind of green velvety dress there. We have a garment from Turkey and India, 
um, Japan on the bottom right hand corner. The young woman with a basket on her head is from Madagascar and her skirt is of silk. It's called a Lamba. Uh, and then we have some European um, suits in, from the 1700s in the center and then dresses from the 1800s. And our fourth natural textile is cotton. Again, cotton comes from um, the seed pod that surrounds the cotton plant. Cotton uh, was native to India, um, but has since been grown elsewhere, including here in the US. Cotton um, wrinkles, but less so than linen. It is less lustrous than linen, but it is a strong, tough fiber that you can kind of do anything to and it will survive. So we tend to use it in things like denim jeans. Um, but we can still use it, depending on how we weave it, for delicate things like this eyelet up here in the corner. So here are some cotton plants blooming, and those are the seed pods around them. It was a tricky uh, ordeal to separate all of the seeds from the cotton balls and um, leaves and other debris, and then to spin the cotton fluff into yarn. Um, the Industrial Revolution helped with that. Of course, in America, we also relied on unpaid enslaved labor to help us with this process. Um, now we don't, thank goodness. Um, and as the Industrial Re Revolution has rolled on, we have um, gotten the manufacturing of this resource into a textile um, much uh, more efficient. And here are some cotton garments. You can see um, a Japanese um, man's garment there in blue. Cotton um, is also kind of a moisture wicking material, not unlike linen. Um, so you can see ladies undergarments from about 100 years ago in the right hand corner. Cotton always takes dye very well. So you can see these brightly colored prints. We've got the calico dress in the bottom left. We have the um, the Turkish garment in the center. We have Elvis wearing a brightly colored cotton print uh, Hawaiian style shirt. Um, and then in the far left corner, we have a 19th century, 19th century ladies English gown made from muslin, which was a very fine, floaty, soft cotton fabric developed from India. So beyond those four textiles, we have some other natural materials that we have been using for millennia. Um, and as I've mentioned before, animal hides have been pretty useful. So here's a bunch of examples of leather, right? So leather is um, an animal skin that has been cleaned and preserved from rotting by this process called tanning, the outside layer. It's a way to kind of um, halt the decomposition of the skin. Um, so you can see um, there's a Native American man's shirt with a fringe. We have a 21st century suede purse in the top right. We have a coat that's made from shearling, um, and that's from a woolly animal, and you preserve the hide with the wool still attached to one side, so it makes it nice and warm. Um, you can see that, that doublet there on the bottom, that's leather that has had all of the fur or hair scraped off completely. And in the center, we have an alligator or crocodile skin um, bag from about 100 years ago. Another big natural material is fur. So fur is from any animal that has fur. And typically when we're using fur as, as a garment material, we're using it with the skin attached. So it has been tanned like the leather or otherwise preserved to keep it from rotting. But you can see the center there that is in, uh, the replica, um, a modern reproduction of a much older Inuit um, seal skin coat. Um, we have a raccoon fur coat from the 1920s. It was a very popular fad. The painting in the top right corner, she's holding a big fur muff, kind of um, the, in, if you don't have mittens, you could just stick your hands in a big tube of fur and keep them warm. And then we have some fur lined garments, the ladies capelet from the 1800s. And the bottom left hand corner is the current king of the Netherlands. And you can see his Velvet cloak is lined with white fur ermine, which has been a traditional fur associated with royalty in Europe for centuries. 
And then other natural materials, we also use grasses and barks. So you can see there's a Hawaiian grass skirt. There's a Japanese bamboo basket. Um, Hawaii is not the only culture that uses grasses and turns them into garments. On the lower right-hand side, we have a Maori man who has a skirt made of grass. Um, and then all around the world, we use straw or reeds or grass to make hats and bags. So we have just two examples. Um, the, the straw hat on the top is from Thailand. The straw hat on the bottom is from either England or France. I can't remember. And in the middle, we have a couple of items of bark cloth. Um, one, that top one is from Samoa and the bottom one is from the Ivory Coast. Um, and bark cloth is what it sounds like. Some trees, we can take the bark and turn it into a textile. Okie doke. So now we've got our natural fibers or materials. How do we turn those things into cloth? Well, at first we probably just draped untanned animal skins or large pieces of bark or leaves over and around our bodies. These were temporary garments. They would wear away or rot um, fairly quickly, and so they were always in need of replacing. So the first textile, as I said, we probably made was felt. Um, the kind of legend that may or may not be true um, says that a traveler had wrapped her feet in hide along with clumps of wool that had just kind of like pulled off the sheep while it was shedding. Um, and she did that to warm her feet while she walked. And then when she arrived at her destination, the fluffy wool um, had been dampened by the sweat from her feet and had turned into a dense water resistant mat of fabric. And everybody said, oh my God, you're a genius. We should do that all the time and turn it into a textile. And so they did. Who knows if that's true, but it's a great story. So felting can be accomplished by boiling wool or other hair fibers until the fibers stick together. And then you beat them with um, into a like a flat mat and then the mat gets draped over the body or you can cut it into shapes and sew those shapes together to make tailored garments. So once we had mastered felting it took us a little while longer you can see somewhere between 500,000 BCE and 100,000 BCE we started wearing the skins like I just talked about but it wasn't until about 25,000 BCE that we have evidence of weaving from wild grown grasses. And these were located uh, in Central Europe. Doesn't mean we weren't doing it before, but obviously grass isn't gonna stick around very long for a fossil record. So this is the oldest example that we have. We know that we start, we were using bone needles by 10,000 to 15,000 BCE. We have found bone needles in Siberia. So that means when we have a needle, that means we are punching holes in the textile and stitching it together, probably with thread made of sinew at the beginning. And then by about 7,000 BCE, we started cultivating flax for linen. This is in the Near East, Egypt, Mesopotamia, um, those areas. And then a um, thousand or 500 years after that, we found evidence of knitting. And then by 5,000 BCE, so 7,000 years ago, we began cultivating cotton, native to India, also native to Peru on the other side of the planet. Um, and this is around the same time that people in China began cultivating silk and people in lots of different places figured out how to tan animal hides to keep them from rotting. And around 3000 BCE, we started figuring out how to breed sheep for better wool. They used to be more like hair than like fluffy wool. And we figured out how to get them to make fluffier wool. And so... Around 20 to 30,000 years ago, we figured out how to make yarn, right? If you've ever had a cat or a dog, I'm sure you've like rolled their hair between your fingers, just, you know, as you're getting it off your clothes or your couch or whatever, right? And so you've made a little tiny short piece of yarn by doing that. Well, from there, we figured out how to make really, really long lengths of yarn by twisting plant fibers or protein fibers together. Um, so you, you bundle them together and then you stretch them out while you're twisting them. And then you're creating a fine string or a thread. Once you have thread, you can knot them together or lace them together and make kind of a net. And you can do this with your hands, which is called finger weaving, or you can do this on needles, which we call knitting. We probably did the finger weaving first and then we figured out it might be easier to knit. 
so we did that for a while, right? And so that's convenient, right? You knit things together to make bags or um, skirts or nets to catch fish or other game or what have you, right? And then by about 5000 BCE, we developed looms, which were machines that are going to hold a whole bunch of threads in tension and are going to allow us to cross threads over each other and and by going over, under, over, under, over, under, and then reversing it, you're going to make something called a woven cloth. And what that does is the fibers are going to be stable. They're going to stick together. They are going to be nice and tight together. So they're going to um, not have a lot of holes in them. So it's going to be sturdy, but it's still going to be malleable. And so it makes a much more long lived textile to work with than those woven grasses. And so once we had these looms, this allowed us to control the size and the shape and the color. And then we figured out how to weave in different patterns of our cloth so we could kind of come up with endless variations. So here's a young Berber woman in Morocco, and she is spinning that fluffy wool fiber into thread. You can see the spindle in her right hand and her um, or the spindles in her left hand and um, the other part of it is in her right. Um, so this photo was taken in the late 80s, but this has been going on for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and it still persists. Here's an example of finger weaving. I've never tried this myself, but I'm told it's fairly simple to get the hang of. And with finger weaving, you make long kind of tubes. So um, they could be useful, I suppose, for belts or leashes or things like that. Um, and then you can see on the right, there's a, a Navajo um, man demonstrating finger weaving. And when we develop looms, we develop them in several different places around the world at kind of the same time, um, which I think means people just kind of came up with the same idea, like made the obvious logical um, leap to to innovate. Um, and we had came up with two kinds of looms. You can have a vertical loom or you can have a horizontal loom. Horizontal looms first were staked out on the ground, um, which made them very portable. All you had to do was drive a few posts into the ground and then set up your threads and then you could do it. Um, so if you were a, a, a people that traveled um, from place to place a lot, this is, this is a pretty easy machine to pack up and unpack and take with you when you went. If you were gonna be staying in one place um, for a while, you might um, construct a horizontal loom and um, to keep the tension on those threads, because you don't have a bottom on this horizontal loom, you can see these clay weights at the bottom. And so those are holding the threads down and holding them kind of tight so that you can get that good um, tight weave when you go across. And then of course, once we figured out how to make thread and then how to weave that thread into a cloth, we wanted to do even more fun things. So we figured out how to modify our fabric. One of the quickest ways to modify your fabric is to dye it. So when you're dyeing fabric, you're allowing color that you can derive from plants, for example, indigo from blue, um, or animals, um, a certain kind of mollusk that is native to the Mediterranean. Um, if, you, if you kill them and then smush their bodies up, they will create a purple dye. Or you can um, extract dyes from minerals, for example, ochre um, creates red. Um, and these dyes then kind of get chemically absorbed into the textile fiber and react with it and then will kind of stay put. Different fibers are gonna react differently to different dyes. And some fibers require something called a mordant, which sounds like a dead thing. But what it means is like it's it's the thing that's going to keep the dye in place to keep it from leaching and leaking back out. So, for example, cotton, um, if you're dyeing cotton, you want to add salt to your water when you're dyeing. Um, if you're dyeing wool or silk, you're going to want to add vinegar to keep the dye um, stable and bound to your fabric. And so dyeing is different from painting because in painting, you're mixing pigment with a binder and you're brushing it onto the surface of a textile. So it's kind of like a physical bond, but it doesn't um, chemically bond with the textile and infuse all the way through to its core the way dyeing does. So here are some examples of, of different techniques that people use to, to get that dyed effect into the fabric.
And of course, you can dye your fabric all one color, or you can dye your fabric in a different gradation of color. So it goes from light to dark, right? Just by keeping it in the bath longer at certain points than at others. Or you can do something called resist dyeing, which is when you say, I want the color to go here, but not there, right? So if you've ever done a tie-dyed shirt at summer camp, you know what I'm talking about. And you can see there's some different methods to have it done. Um, there's batik dyeing where you, you put wax on and then where the wax is, the, the um, dye isn't going to go, right? Kind of like Easter eggs. Um, or this shibori dyeing is kind of very sophisticated, fancy tie dye. You can see those in the blue um, textiles down on the bottom. Of course, there are other ways to embellish fabric as well. You can paint the fabric. You can print it where you, you know, take a an image and have it on a stamp and kind of stamp it on it or, you know, over and over and over again with a machine. You can embroider on it, right, where you're, you're sewing decorative stitches, maybe in a contrasting color on it. Or you can add trim, you know, ribbon, lace, braid, or feathers, or jewels, or shells, or fringe, or things like that. Or you can cut into the fabric to make a kind of lace-like effect. So hopefully one takeaway you've gotten from this discussion today is that the process of turning fibers into thread and then turning the thread into cloth is a very labor intensive process. So people had to be very, very thrifty with their cloth. Every thread counted, so they didn't waste it at all. So to turn that cloth, once you have it, into clothes, um, you're gonna have to make some smart choices. The thriftiest thing to do is to drape that cloth around your body, right? Which just means to lay it over and across and through and around your body in an artful way. And then you can secure it with a belt or with a brooch or some other kind of pin, right? And that way, whatever size textile you wove, that's going to be on your body. So you're not wasting any of that fabric. And then that garment becomes a one size fits all kind of garment because you're just going to fold it differently depending if you're taller or short or bigger or smaller around um, or if you've grown, right? So the statue on the left is an example of a man who's wearing a draped toga. And you can see it's just kind of swaddled around him and then held in place over one arm. He might have a pin securing it to his shoulder, um, but it is that full rectangle of cloth that came off the loom. If we feel like we have money to burn, we can take that textile off the loom and instead of draping it around our body, we can cut that fabric into shapes and then sew those shapes together in a way that's going to fit the body more closely, which means we're gonna have little scraps of fabric that we throw out, but we're not gonna care. When we do this, right, we're creating something that we would call tailored, a garment that is fitting a specific wearer, kind of custom made for you. This means more steps in the process, as well as more waste. But in the end, you come out with a garment that is made, you know, more or less just for you. Obviously, we can go to the mall and, and we can buy, you know, small, medium, large of things. And, and so they're, they're one size fits many, right? But we could go to a tailor and have them measure us from head to toe and build us a suit or a dress that is made just perfectly for us and no one else. So you can see a tailored suit there on the right from the early 20th century, um, a tail coat and pants, right? Fits the body very closely, really accentuates different parts of the human form, um, creates you know, ease of movement perhaps that the, the toga might not. Um, and generally, you, know, you have less cloth covering the body and more of the body revealed even when it's covered. So those are the basic ideas I wanted to cover with you today. Hope you'll keep mulling them over and think about them as we um, approach different cultures and eras in the rest of this class. Thanks for listening.